just waiting for the slides. And as soon as they're up, we're going to get going here. Because they're kind of important to this one. There's a lot of them, and we get going through it pretty quickly. There we go. OK. A couple years ago, I pirated an audiobook. I couldn't find it in the bookstores, but I was able to find it online. And it completely changed the way I think about memorizing things. It was by eight-time world memory champion Dominic O'Brien. Yes, there's a such thing as the world memory championships, and they do cool little events like seeing who can memorize the longest string of random binary digits. So if you can imagine doing that against the best in the world. So I read this book, and man, I felt like I could memorize anything. I was going out for walks, seeing how many license plates I could memorize as cars drove by me. And after a week of this, I discovered something really important. That memorizing license plates is a waste of time. <laughs> It was, I would say, an even bigger waste of time than that week I spent teaching myself how to play video game music on the recorder. <laughs> but I don't know about you, this, this idea of learning language really quickly was important to me because I sucked in French class. I mean, like bottom of the barrel, everybody in this room did better than I did at French class, even if you didn't take French. That's how bad I did. And we had to learn about uh, 10 words a week or something like that. And I would study, study, study. And as soon as I finished studying, whoop, the words were just out of my head. And so it was tedious. It was tough to remember. It was boring. And I think these are all things we can really change with language learning. So we can make it more fun and exciting, which we're going to do in just a couple of minutes. And we can make it stickier because I don't know about you. I forgot so much of it. And even if you guys did really well in French, I have a feeling you probably remember about as little as I do. So we're going to test that right now. I'm going to throw a sentence up in English, and we're all going to translate it together, out loud, into French. We're just going to kind of go on the fly here. So here we go. Does everybody have this? We're going to translate on three. One, two, three. And there's a couple people over here who know French, and this whole side was completely silent and just kind of staring in awe. But that's, that's normal. What happens is we've taken French class, and even for those of you who learned it, if you've forgotten a lot, nine years of classes to forget so much that we can't do this, that's, that's unacceptable. We need to find a way to make it stickier. So we learn it and we don't have to forget it and relearn it, forget it and relearn it. And also we need to find a way to make it faster. Because even if I could have done this, nine years of classes, or maybe when you went to school it was different, two years, four years. But for me, nine years, that's too long to, to take to try and be able to do this. So, well, we need it faster, but I'm sure as soon as I said, we need some way faster to make language learning. A lot of people thought immediately, we have a faster way. It's called immersion. Well, immersion isn't necessarily faster in how much you learn per hour. It's just more hours in the day. So while I was doing one hour French class per day, the immersion kids were off doing six hours. And that's, that's OK, but it's not significantly faster in how much they learn per hour, maybe a little more. For me, it was 10 words a week. That's what I was tested on. For emerging kids, maybe it's 10 a day, maybe, let's be generous, say 20 words a day that they completely memorize, never have to practice again, they've got them in their heads forever. Well, how did our man Dominic O'Brien do this, world memory champion? His personal best happens to be not 20 a day, but 320. Oh, sorry, this slide's wrong. That one's right. 320 German words in an hour is his personal best. But how does he do this? Because he's actually not a genius. He had dyslexia. So he had a learning disability. He's just a normal guy who worked really hard to find a method that was effective. And I can describe this to you, but it's going to be much more fun for us to just kind of do it. And we're going to go at this pace. We're going to go about 320 an, uh, an hour. We might drop down to 200 an hour, but that's still pretty fast. And German words are pretty close to English ones, so we're going to do Japanese, because that's a little, a little more out there for us. And Going at this pace, I feel really bad for the woman over here doing sign language. I apologize. <laughs> All right. So ready to go? The Japanese word for cat sounds like the English word neck. Neko. Neck. Neko. So all we do is we picture a cat with a really long neck. And now we've got it. The Japanese word for training, so like we're practicing something, like boxing, training is just the English word cake with an O at the end of it. It's keiko. Keiko. So picture Rocky Balboa, and instead of a punching bag, he's training with the cake, and he's like, Creed! Ah! <laughs> now the Japanese word for cell phone is keitai. Keitai. So picture a KKK member wearing this as a tie. And if that offends you, fantastic, because that means you're going to remember it better than anybody else in this room. <laughs> that's, that's one of the reasons I think adults have a key advantage for learning languages over kids, is we get offended by way more stuff. I've never heard an incensed three-year-old shout at somebody, you voted for Stephen Harper? What were you thinking? 
But adults do all the time, we get offended by more. And the point isn't to be offended, it's to be emotionally stimulated. To be emotionally stimulated by the material. That can be being offended, uh, it can be being surprised, laughing, being sexually aroused, and it's easy to do all of these things with mnemonics. Now, there's a key distinction between stimulating material and just a stimulating situation. So if we try to learn with a game, it doesn't really work well because it just creates a stimulating situation. But the material is still boring. And if it was just a stimulating situation we needed, everybody would be taking their language books to Canada's Wonderland and going on a roller coaster and reading, and by the end of the day, they'd have everything memorized for the rest of their lives. But that doesn't work. What we need is two parts of the actual content to be stimulating. So we've got the sound of the word, keiko, and we've got the definition, training, and they work together in this really messy way that, that becomes memorable and it sticks in your head. But we're not done yet because right now these are just free-floating pieces of information that we've created here. They're kind, of, uh, they're kind of floating around like this in your head. And that's okay if you've got three or four just floating around, you can find them. You can find all the numbers on here. But with language, you need to learn thousands of pieces of information. And pretty soon your head starts to look like this. And it feels like this. And if I ask you to find the number 27, you can do it, but you have to wade through everything. It's going to take you quite a while. But if I take the same information and I organize it in a way that makes sense to you, we get this. It's just the multiplication table. And now if I ask you to find 27, everybody knows where to find it. You can find it twice. And if I ask you what 7 times 7 is, and you don't remember, you know exactly where to go to find out. And that's what we're going to do with these mnemonics. We need to place them somewhere in the physical world so that if we forget a word, we know exactly where to go to find it. No more having the word on the tip of your tongue. You'll just know where to go. So we're going to do that with cat. The first cat that I think of happens to be my friend's cat, Vladdy. Vladdy's cute. Now I have to think, where does Vladdy spend most of his time? Well, he's a weird cat. It's not the windowsill or anything. Vladdy spends most of his time in the sink. This picture's, <laughs> this picture's dark because I didn't want to wake him with the flash. But he's always in the sink. So when I think cat, I think of a cat in the sink. It's just where I picture them. So now I picture Vladdy with his long neck hanging out of the sink. So now I think, oh, what's the word for cat? I picture Vladdy, he's in the sink, I see the long neck, oh, it's Nako. So what do we do now with the cake? We put that somewhere where you associate with training. It might be a boxing gym, it might be the YMCA. For me, I do a lot of training in my living room on my Chuck Norris Total Gym. So that's where it goes. And if I forget training, I go to my living room, I see that I've got the cake, and I think, ah, oh, Keiko. But there's a little problem here. I'm going to leave this up just because it's such a flattering slide. There's a little problem here with overlap, because if you're learning more than one language, then how do you differentiate? How do you know that the word I put on skyscraper on the, the Princess Towers building is the Japanese word and not the Chinese word if I'm learning two languages? Well, it's simple. You use two cities. So the Japanese word goes on the, the skyscraper in Kingston and the Chinese word goes on the CN Tower in Toronto. Household uh, appliance words, they go in my home in Kingston. Household appliance words for Chinese instead of Japanese, they go in my old home in Toronto. So I've got two different cities, and that way, if I'm thinking I need to know Japanese right now, I go to Kingston instead of Toronto. Now, what happens next is what if you're some sort of kid who doesn't go out? You don't know any cities, you're just a shut-in, you stay at home, you know, watch nothing but Simpsons episodes all day. This is, this is a frame from a Simpsons episode. It's one of my favorite gags is when Radioactive Man is uh, he's about to get washed away by this big tidal wave of acid. And just before the acid hits him, he puts on these little protective goggles. And as the acid washes him away, he screams out in pain, my eyes, the goggles do nothing. <laughs> so if I'm using the Simpsons to learn a language, because you can put a whole language in the Simpsons, and I want to learn the Japanese word for acid, I go to the place where the acid is in the Simpsons. Now the Japanese word happens to be san. Easy to remember because it's sand without the D. So now I go to the acid, and instead of seeing green acid, I picture it as sand. Easy. You can put the whole language in the Simpsons like this. Now, there is one limitation with this system, and that is there can only be so many words in Japanese or any other language that are a lot like English words. There are only so many that are that close. A lot of people try to say it's really low, like maybe two dozen or something like that. After that, the system fizzles out and it's useless. I've done quite a few of these. Uh, I've done a few thousand, and I can say in Japanese alone, that number is actually in the hundreds. And depending on the language, how close it is to English, you can get over a thousand very easily. But you do still run into a snag. So for example, my Japanese English dictionary has three pages of words that start with S-H-I-N, shin. 
The same dictionary in the English section doesn't have three pages of English words that start with that, just three words. They're right here, these are the only three. Shin, shine, shiny. So if we get a list of Japanese words that looks like this, there's no way we're gonna get a unique English word corresponding with each one of those. So we've got a bit of a problem. Right now, all we've done are mnemonics that are one part. The one neck in Neko, the one cake in Keiko and on the floor there. So what we're gonna do now is just split these up. So now we've got the left side and the right side, and these are gonna be two parts. Everything on the left side here, that's gonna be a knight in shining armor. So now I think, anytime I see a knight in shining armor, that's gonna be Shin. So the, now we only have the right side to work with, that's all we have to do now. So we've got house up there, it sounds like house without the H. So this one's gonna be a knight in shining armor and a house, it's gonna be two parts. The next one below that is really fun, it means endurance, it's Shinbo. So now we've got a knight in shining armor and he's running in this endurance race. But he's got the armor, it's really heavy. So to give himself an advantage, he uses his bow and he's shooting down all the other competitors. So Shinbo is endurance. And next after that, we've got the knight in shining armor and he's wrestling with Chewbacca. And then the Pillsbury Doughboy gets involved with dough there at the end. And then he's using Jiu-Jitsu. And down here at the very bottom, we've got the knight in shining armor and Pooh. I don't have a visual aid for this one. I'm working on it and I'll get back to you. But what happens here is the system's doing something really beautiful where this means Catholic priest and when you get a knight in shining armor, poo and a Catholic priest, it sounds like the introduction to a really good joke. But I'm not trying to inject humor into this. I didn't know when I was doing this list that there was gonna be the knight in shining armor and poo, it just happened. This system becomes funny, it becomes memorable on its own, which is really beautiful. And when I was doing this list, putting this together, I ended up doing that entire section of the dictionary, those three pages. Not because I'm some sort of memory champion, I'm really good at this, just because I got laughing at this knight in shining armor and I wanted to see what he was gonna do next. So, after that, <laughs> I was doing this on a Friday and it's not that I'm some genius that I was able to do this, I just didn't have a date last Friday. So, I picked up my language dictionary and it ended up doing that many pages. But let's say you're a nomad, let's say maybe you're like Megan, you want to travel to a bunch of places and learn a lot of languages, or maybe you just want to go on vacation. If you're doing the method I had to do in high school and elementary school for French, 10 words a week, let's say you want to learn 2,000 words to be really comfortable with a language. That's going to give you four years of study time. And if you do immersion, it's going to be fewer years, but it's going to be more hours per day. And most of us don't want to wait four years for our next vacation. We don't want to do more than six, hour, or six hours a day of, of dedicated time to language. We don't have that kind of time. Maybe if you're a young kid, you really do, but most of us don't. So what if we're doing this method where you can go at 320 words an hour? Well, then you could learn those 2,000 words in an afternoon. Or maybe you break that up. Maybe you break that up and you do one hour a night for not even a full week. But let's say you want to go slower than we were going here. You want to do 100 words an hour, or maybe 100 words a day, which is much slower than what we've been doing here today. Then it's still going to take you only 20 days to learn those 2,000 words. So we've got a way that makes language learning more fun. Imagine, imagine a, uh, a Canada where each kid goes to school, they do French for one year, and then they're done with it because they know it. What do we do with the other eight years? Teach them eight more languages? Maybe eight more subjects that are really important but we don't have time for in the current system. Either way, we're gonna get kids who enjoy language a lot more, have more fun learning it, like I hope you did today. And all these images, without even trying, they're gonna get stuck in their heads, like I know they're stuck in yours. Thank you very much.